that you are. If you would like some focus helps, some crosswords, just head over to Haley and or pop up your hand or something like that. There's some study supports over there. Yes. I wouldn't mind doing some coloring in. No. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Sam, for those of you uh, who don't know me. Um, I uh, am one of the ministers of Redlands Presbyterian Church, um, and so I, I would normally be worshipping at Capalaba alongside Josh and, and those there at Capalaba. Um, but it's my privilege this morning to be here, um, to be sharing God's Word with you. Um, it's wonderful to be, be visiting again. Um, it's great to, to see a lot of you. Uh, it's great to see all of you. Um, but great to catch up with a lot of you uh, already this morning. I just wanted to give a really quick update. Um, so I'm, as one of the ministers, my uh, uh, role is to oversee youth and young adults and, and our night church uh, congregation. And so I'll just let you know that um, thank you uh, for your prayers and, and to let you know that your prayers have been answered in lots of ways. Uh, God has been very good in, in growing our youth group and, and ensuring that the, the preaching of his word is, is uh, part, as an essential part of, of our gatherings each Friday night. And so we've seen... Uh, lots of youth come and, and be part of that, and it's really great to see uh, a lot of our youth have that, that passion to want to invite their friends to come and hear God's Word uh, and to be part of um, what we do on a Friday night. Um, so thank you for your prayers there. Um, and also, um, just to let you know as well, our, our young adults and uh, our night church congregation have also been growing in lots of ways. Um, we recently uh, did an evangelistic uh, course at our, young, uh, at our night church service, uh, which saw... Um, quite a few non-Christians come and, and connect in with our church, which has been really fantastic. Um, so thank you for your prayers. Um, and if you've got a Bible in front of you, I'd love for you to have it out uh, and open to Galatians chapter 1 and chapter 2 as we work our way through God's Word together and continue uh, through our series in Galatians. And hopefully this click is going to work for me because I do not have much luck when it comes to technology. So we'll see. Uh, but you don't have to look very far, do you, to, um, to see the problem that our society has with authority. Uh, in Aussie sports today, it was working, uh, especially in rugby and in football, many refs, they are walking away from their jobs because their authority isn't being respected or taken seriously by both players and spectators. Um, at a pop culture level, authority is, is often undermined. The authority figure in the movie Shrek, if you remember good old Lord Farquaad, he is portrayed as this small, petty, selfish man who's just out to belittle others for his own gain. None of the other characters take him seriously and they all undermine his authority. Now, he is a fictional character, but even so, it says something about our culture, doesn't it? Our Western society, the society that we live in, it is suspicious about authority. More and more, we are looking for ways to become our own authority over our own lives. We don't like it when other people's values get in the way of our own. And more and more, we're alienating ourselves from those around us because we, we view, we've started to view other people as either our enemies or as our competitors. We are suspicious of authority. And for good reason. There's been too many people who have used their authority to abuse others for their own gain. We are suspicious of authority. And yet without authority, our societies, they crumble. And that's the concern that the Apostle Paul has for the churches that he writes to in Galatia in our passage today. But this time, it's Paul's authority that's in question. Is Paul claiming authority so that he can build something good, or is he claiming authority for his own selfish gain? Well, sitting in the background of this letter, there is this rumour going around that, that Paul isn't the real deal. False teachers have been trying to poke holes in Paul's authority, claiming that Paul's not an authentic apostle. He wasn't there at Jesus' resurrection. He's not the real deal. So our passage today, it is Paul's argument in this space. Paul wants to make it very clear to these churches that these rumours about his authority, they are wrong. And the reason he spends so much time making this argument is because these churches in Galatia, they have taken their eyes off Jesus. They've let this rumour distract them. They've lost focus of what's most important. They've lost focus of the good news of Jesus. 
And we are in danger of doing the same thing if we loosen our grip on the authority that God's Word has over our lives too. And that's what we're going to be pushing into today as we we take a look at this part of Paul's letter to the Galatians. And there's three headings that we're going to be working through as we do this. The authenticity of Paul's authority, the transforming power of Jesus' authority, and the mission that comes with authority. But before we unpack the authenticity of Paul's authority, let's come before God once more and let's uh, pray together. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how worthy you are to receive glory and honour and praise. For by your word, Lord, all things are made, and by your word, they all hold together. Your word, Father, is alive and active. It's a lamp for our feet, a double-edged sword for our hearts and souls, and is able to make us wise for salvation through Jesus Christ, your Son. So, Father, we ask that as we come to your word again now, that you would enable us by your Spirit to hear you speak and to sit under your word as our voice of authority. Help us to see Jesus and draw to him now. These things we pray for your glory, Father, and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. So our passage it starts in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. Paul argues for the authenticity of his authority. That's our first point. The authenticity of Paul's authority. Let's read from verse 11. Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Now, it might seem trivial to you as to why Paul wants to labor this point so much, but the argument that Paul is making here, it couldn't be more relevant for the current culture that we live in. We are living in the era of cancel culture, the social phenomenon of publicly rejecting particular people or groups or brands because of their unacceptable social or moral views. Since this movement kind of switched up a gear back in 2020, we've seen productions like Gone with the Wind and even an episode of Faulty Towers cancelled by society and completely removed from all streaming platforms. Author J.K. Rowling, who created the Harry Potter series, she has been cancelled by many because of her views on womanhood. Even atheist Richard Dawkins was stripped of his Humanist of the Year award because of perceived insults that he made to some minority groups. We don't like it when other people's values get in the way of our own. But how far are we willing to let this cancel culture phenomenon go? Well, believe it or not, there are a number of Christians, I use that term loosely here, a number of Christians in our world today who have gone so far as to cancel the Apostle Paul and his writings. Here are some arguments that I found online from people who have cancelled Paul. One person said, Paul said he saw Jesus, but all that stuff he said Jesus told him was contradictory to what the other Christians had said. Another person wrote, Paul is indeed a heretic. He is self-appointed apostle with many lies. And yet another person also wrote, the fact that Paul heard voices and contradicted Jesus and made up his own religion is enough for any honest person to state that he did not represent Christianity and he should be discarded and everything written by Paul should be thrown out of the Bible. These comments are written by people who call themselves Christians. So even today, it is no trivial thing for us to try and make sense of what Paul is writing here in Galatians 1 and 2. Like the churches in Galatia, we also live in a time where there's plenty of people out there discrediting Paul's authority and and slandering his teaching, even in churches. The passage we're looking at today is Paul's own defense to these claims. So what is Paul saying? Well, in verses 11 and 12 that we just read, Paul claims that he receives his authority from Jesus himself. That his message, it comes from Jesus, come down directly from Jesus by revelation. And that's really important for all of us to understand. Because whether you esteem Paul as as an authentic apostle with authority, or you discredit him, Paul is inviting all of us here to not just listen to the opinions of others, but to check the facts. 
to test his claims and to do so by keeping Jesus in focus. One of these false claims says that Paul is a self-appointed apostle, but, but that's not what Paul is saying here in Galatians. And that's not what Luke describes in the book of Acts either. In fact, for a person to become an apostle, there are two uh, found fundamental criteria. Number one, they, they have, have to have met the resurrected Jesus. And number two, they have to have been chosen and called by Jesus. See, not all of Jesus' disciples, all of Jesus' followers were, were apostles. Only those that, that Jesus had specifically revealed himself to after his resurrection and then also had chosen and called were given this authority or this office of apostle. And we see this in, in Acts chapter 1. As the other apostles, they're, they're looking to replace Judas, who betrayed Jesus. They don't just pick the person that they like best. Here's what we read in Acts 1. Peter said, It is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So there's the first qualification. They must have met the risen Lord Jesus. Peter continues, or Acts continues, So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. So there's the second qualification. They must have been chosen and called by Jesus. And they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, and so he was added to the 11 apostles. Now, how did that work out for Paul? How did that work out for Paul? Well, Paul tells us briefly how it happened later in, in this passage in Galatians. But Gospel writer Luke, he also tells us twice, and in considerable detail, in Acts chapter 9 and in Acts chapter 26, how this happened for Paul. And, and the two qualifications, they are, they are there in both accounts. Jesus appears after his resurrection to Paul on the road to Damascus, and Jesus chooses and calls Paul to be his servant who will preach and teach the Word of God. See, when, when we question the authenticity of Paul's authority, we are bringing into question the authority of Jesus himself. And that's the point that Paul is making here in Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12. The message that he has been preaching and teaching, it's not from himself. It's not even from the apostles in Jerusalem. It comes directly from the source. It comes directly from Jesus and with Jesus' authority. So you don't have to like Paul, but you are called by God to listen to him and to sit under his authority because he speaks with the authority of the crucified and risen Lord Jesus. The writings of Paul that we have before us in the Bible come to us as God breathed words of Scripture and nothing less. Now, you might not discredit Paul or deliberately subvert his teaching, but there are subtle ways that we do undermine the authority of Scripture. After all, that, that's always been the root problem of sin, hasn't it? Adam and Eve, they first sinned because they didn't listen to the Word of God. And every person ever since, including you and me, we are inclined to do the same thing. We all subvert the Word of God, the authority of Scripture. Some of us in really obvious ways, but most of us in quite subtle ways. And usually because something we read in the Bible doesn't quite fit with our worldview. Did you hear Jesus' warning in that parable in Matthew 7? If you continue to put worldly wisdom and advice above Jesus' authority, you will be swept away, destroyed, and absolutely obliterated come Judgment Day. But if you want to be safe from the fierce storm of God's wrath come that day, then humble yourself before Jesus. Let His good words guide your life. Build your house, your life, on His rock. Sit under His authority as the crucified and risen King. Because that's who He is. Sitting under the authority of Scripture is what we are called to as followers of Jesus, as followers of our King. He is our King who went to the cross to die for us, to give us a new life set free from sin. 
and to make us citizens of His forever kingdom. He even poured out His Holy Spirit into our hearts to enable us to listen and obey God's Word. So as followers of Jesus, we are called to take Scripture as the very words of our King and to submit to His authority over our lives. So when you come across things in Scripture that don't quite align with your worldview, it's an opportunity to seek the Holy Spirit's wisdom, to repent, to turn to Jesus, and to trust that what He says is good for us really is good for us. Just because the world does something and enjoys it, it doesn't mean it's good for you or beneficial, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10. Yes, sometimes it's going to be hard to follow Jesus at His word. But as Christians, we are not called to live the easy life. We are called to follow our King who gave His life for us. Be careful, church, to not let your worldview teach you how to interpret God's Word. Instead, let God's Word teach you how to live in the world as a follower of King Jesus. Build your life on His rock, on the rock of His authority, instead of on the sandy opinions of others. See, understanding where Paul gets his authority from, it's no trivial thing. And as a church, we have to guard ourselves from the influences of the world around us. To be careful not to subvert the authority of Scripture, but to keep Jesus in focus, because it's Jesus, the Son of God, who gives authenticity to Paul's authority. Okay, now that we've laid all that foundation, seeing the authenticity of Paul's authority, we can move a little bit faster through this, the rest of the passage. We've only touched on two verses so far. But the story that Paul launches into from verse 13, it is proof of his argument. That, that his authority it doesn't come from the apostles in Jerusalem, but directly from God. And the very fact that Paul mentions in verse 18 that it took him three years to visit Jerusalem after Jesus appeared to him, which shows us the transforming power of Jesus' authority. The transforming power of Jesus' authority. Now, they say that there's two kinds of people in the world. You've got to get this right. There are thinkers and there are feelers. Thinkers are people who tend to be more logical and practical, who, who often lead with their head, while feelers, they're more emotive and empathetic and they tend to lead with their hearts. If you've never taken a personality test before and you're not sure which one of these you are, well, let me save you some time. If you're a thinker, you already know. And then the rest of you, if you feel like you might be a feeler, you're a feeler. Now, of course, our personalities, they're much more nuanced than this. But when it comes to the Christian life, most of us tend to swing either one way or the other. Have you noticed that before? Either we go big on our knowledge of Jesus and we love God with all of our minds. Or we go big on our experience with Jesus and we love God with all of our hearts. And yet, what does Paul do? Well, let's read from verse 13. Paul writes, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So this, this is a picture of Paul before he met the risen Jesus. And in Acts chapter 9, uh, we are told that Paul, then known as Saul, was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, against Jesus' followers. Let's keep reading. Galatians 1, verse 15. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me, now Paul's talking about his encounter here with Jesus, so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia and later I returned to Damascus. Now, is, is Paul here, is he loving God with all of his mind or is he loving God with all of his heart? It was both, isn't it? Both. See, before Paul met the authority of Jesus, he was intensely and passionately persecuting Christians. His heart was all in for God, or at least he thought it was all in for God. And yet, 
he was do, also doing it in ways where he was advancing beyond many of his Jewish contemporaries. So his, his head, it was all in for God. And then after meeting the, the, the risen Jesus, his, his head and his heart, they change direction, don't they? Jesus' authority, it just transforms Paul. He didn't suddenly lose heart. He didn't suddenly lose his passion. And he didn't lose his head either, his lack of knowledge. But immediately he stopped persecuting the church. And instead, he went and started sharing the good news of Jesus with people all around Arabia. Because he knew in his head that this was the truth that people needed to hear. And his heart ached for the lost. That God in his grace sent his son Jesus to us to offer us forgiveness and freedom. And because of the work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' authority captured Paul's head and his heart and it transformed him. And this is the same transformation that we get to experience when we sit under the authority of Jesus. When we meet Jesus in Scripture and we allow His Spirit to change us, our heads and our hearts, they get to experience this amazing transformation as well. The problem that a lot of us have, though, is that we hinder the Holy Spirit's work in this space. Because we're so set on being either thinkers or feelers. Thinkers often have an unwillingness to sit with their emotions, and, and you're often reluctant to listen to the Spirit as He speaks into that part of your life. And feelers have a tendency to, to doubt their capacity to grow in their knowledge of God, to allow the Spirit to guide you in, in the truth. But that's the Spirit's role. His work in your life is to transform you, to take you from being someone who rejects God and, and wants nothing to do with Him, to enabling you to live out Jesus' greatest commandment. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength and the way that we allow the spirit to do this work is by sitting under jesus authority by reading the bible not as a textbook that can bolster your theological knowledge nor as a book that validates your feelings but as the whole life transforming word of god that is both useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, and also alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, able to penetrate even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Because when we sit under God's Word and let it speak over us, we don't simply encounter a, a set of rules to follow, or, or a theological debate to learn, or even a religion to submit to, we encounter a person. We encounter the Lord Jesus, the Word who became flesh for us. To not just teach us how to live, but to show us. And, and who invites us into that experience with Himself that we might not just know about Him, but so that we can know and in our passage in Galatians 1, verses 22 and 23, that's what the churches in Judea are praising God for. The Paul who used to passionately persecute the church has now been so transformed by Jesus' authority that he's passionately teaching and sharing Jesus in the church. It's incredible. Paul's become so transformed by Jesus that he's become like Jesus in mind, soul, heart, and in strength. The man who formerly persecuted us, says the church in verse 23, is now preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy. Amazing transformation. And this transformation, it doesn't go away after time. God continues to transform his, his people to grow us by his spirit more and more into the image of his son, of Jesus. So that even after 14 years, Paul still continues to share the good news of Jesus with the same passion and the same zeal that he had there in the beginning which we see there in, in Galatians 2, verses 1 to 5. Even when the false teachers again try to infiltrate in verse 4 and divide the church, Paul continues with his head and his heart all in for Jesus to ensure, verse 5, that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for the sake of the church, for the sake of God's people. And that's the transforming power of Jesus' authority. 
the more time we spend with Jesus in his word, experiencing him in heart, mind, soul and strength, the more we grow in his likeness, the more we grow to imitate him in, in all areas of our life. But tell me, how, how can you imitate someone unless you study them? Unless you, you spend time with them, unless you get to know them? See, Jesus gave us the apostles, men like Peter, James, John, and Paul, men who, who knew Jesus and met Jesus firsthand to tell us exactly what he was like. So that by the work of his spirit, we could imitate him and become just like him. But that's not going to happen if you neglect to read your Bible. You're not going to grow in your love for God if your Bible's just gathering dust on a shelf somewhere. If you're a Christian who is struggling to let go of your love for the world, then it's worth asking yourself, how much time are you actually spending intentionally getting to know Jesus? How often are you allowing yourself to be captured by His life, by His love that we find in His Word? But something that really transformed my thinking in this space a few years ago was this question I once came across in a podcast, which said this, Jesus is a real person who delights, he delights to be with you. How can you sh let him know that you delight to be with him? How can you let him know that you delight to be with him? Meet him in his word. And experience the whole life transforming power of his authority. So we've looked at the authenticity of Paul's authority. And we've seen the transforming power of Jesus' authority. We're now going to finish by looking at this mission that comes with authority. And this is in the final verses in verses 6 through to 10. And do you remember those, those arguments we had up earlier? Uh, of people who were, were seeking to cancel Paul as an apostle. Well, one of the claims, actually a couple of those claims that were made, uh, said that, that Paul's message, his mission, it contradicted the teachings of other Christians. But what we get from Galatians 2 verse 6, it is nothing but affirmation and recognition for Paul from not just other Christians, but the other apostles of Jesus. These other apostles who, uh, Peter, James and John, who who'd not just met the risen Jesus, but who followed Jesus throughout his earthly ministry, who, who heard his teaching firsthand, who were there the night he was betrayed, and who, who watched from a distance as he was nailed to the cross and left for dead. These apostles affirm and recognize Paul's message as their very own. There's no contradiction. Peter, Jesus' first disciple, even goes so far in his own letter in 2 Peter, to call the church to accept Paul's words as Scripture. Here's what Peter writes. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other Scriptures to their own destruction. See, Peter's mission was Paul's mission. Along with the other apostles, they were given the task of teaching and preaching the good news of Jesus. The only difference, the only difference which we see there in our passage in verse 8, was that Jesus had given Peter the specific authority to take this gospel, the authority to be on mission, to the circumcised, to the Jews. And he gave Paul specific authority to be on mission to the uncircumcised, the Gentiles. Now, naturally, this is going to mean that their specific ministry is going to look a little different at times. The details of what Paul writes in his letters, at times, is going to look different from the detail that Peter writes, or that John writes, or that James writes. But the message is the same because the mission is the same. Peter writes, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. James writes, come near to God and he will come near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. John writes, for this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And also Paul writes, 
if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Yes, the words look a little different, but the message is the same because the mission has always been the same. And it comes to us from the same authority, from the risen Lord Jesus, who delights to meet you in his word, who gives us his word so that we may know him, we may learn from him, we may grow in every way to be just like him. And that, brothers and sisters, is the grace of God to us. That God, in in all of His glory and all of His splendor and all of His majesty, would choose to reveal Himself to us through the most ordinary way of words written on a page. Praise be to God. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how worthy You are to receive glory and honor and praise. For by your word, all things are made. And by your word, they all hold together. Lord, help us to draw near to you in your word often. To see the Lord Jesus and gaze upon his glorious face that he might be our heart's greatest delight. Help us to cling to him for forgiveness and salvation. To build our life upon his rock. To sit under your authority and to settle, to not settle for the empty teachings of this world. Continue, Lord, to meet us in your word, as you have promised, and continue to transform us, heart, soul, mind, and strength, into the image of your good Son, our Lord Jesus. And help us to take your word to others, Father God, that they too may be transformed by your Spirit. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to do some announcements now, so if you'll, Josh, flick us to the announcements sections.